All right, welcome to our second video on prehistory. This is talking about the agricultural revolution. Now, there had been hunter-gatherer societies for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, but some stuff started changing. The ice age was ending. Look at this line. Look at the temperature going up across the world. And then a sudden plummet, and then a really sudden rise in temperature that got up much, much higher. So these shifts in climate and rain patterns put pressure on hunter-gatherer societies. So there's a little bit of pressure to like try new things, do different things. And some clans had already been engaged in semi-cultivation, which is like casual farming where you just burn everything down and then put some seeds down and then come back later to see what has happened. However, about right in this time period, this major time of change, the agricultural revolution took place. Now that's the first time that it happens and it actually pops up in a bunch of different places independently from one another. But uh, this revolution was when humans shifted to farming and it allows us to control our food supply. So more food is available and reliable. And that meant that farmers could settle in one place and not just have to move around all the time. It also meant that the more reliable food meant more population growth, more calories, more people. Uh, with more people working, that also allows some people to not have to work on the farm. And that gives time for innovation in response to the new technological needs of the time. Here are some innovations down here. Domestication of plants and animals, which means that you're going through and shaping them over time through selective breeding to actually meet your needs as a human. And then some tools to help with the farming. So early farming probably wasn't that much better than hunting and gathering, but humans are able to innovate. And that is what we did. And we got much better over time. In fact, then storing it in uh, clay vessels and using those for cooking and also in weaving, which came up during this time period. So we'll see some examples of those things in specific locations in a minute. But I want to take an aside for a moment to talk about carbon dating. We talked about archaeology last time and uh, what it is. One of the major tools that archaeologists have to give us clear ideas of when things happened is carbon dating. And I apologize for the bad joke over here. Now, um, all living things have carbon-14, which is an isotope of carbon. And the thing about isotopes that are unstable like this is they tend to break down into other isotopes over time. And it's very predictable when, like how often that happens within a given sample, which means you can use how much carbon-14 is left in a sample to tell how old a thing is, which is very cool because that lets us set up a timeline of when stuff happened. And that lets us know a little bit more about maybe what led to what causes and effects. So here are some early settlement locations. Note the early farming settlement stuff's in the Middle East. It's the earliest that we have evidence of, that we have evidence of. Uh, now, these are some of the major places. We're going to talk about two of those in just a second. So first, Jericho. Where is it located? Over here on the map, this is the country, modern-day Israel. This is Jordan. You can see it's to the east of a place called the Dead Sea. And when was it? About... 9,600 years BC and 7,000. So that's 11, more than 11,000 years ago, more than 9,000 years ago. Uh, and it was located at a natural oasis, a place with water in a place that otherwise didn't have all that much water going around. And what we've learned is that it started as a hunter-gatherer camp where they would come back here seasonally um, over time for many thousands of years, but it slowly grew into a community that stayed in that spot and grew wheat and barley and lentils, but still hunted, still did a fair amount of hunting. We have evidence of that. It did eventually develop walls. They built walls around this settlement, though the purpose of these walls is somewhat contested. Like, is it for defense? Was it really for a more ceremonial or a uh, like status purpose, like to impress the tribes that were coming by? A little bit contested. I, I, I go with, def I think defense, uh, we'll see. Uh, but also worthy of note here are these plastered skulls. Very cool. So this is an actual human skull that has shells for eyes and the face has been plastered over. And if you spin it around, you can see that they cut into the skull to fill it full of stuff so that it would support all the bones of the face so they could make it look like the person looked when they were alive, which is real like, it's kind of dark and cool and maybe seasonal because Halloween is coming up, everybody. But the reason that's important is because we know this is a major shift in the burial practices, where this person 
was buried as an important person, maybe indicating some early signs of a little bit of hierarchy developing. And also definitely a lot more attention paid to uh, the supernatural and, you know, an afterlife or something like that. It's suggestive of those things. Katul Hoyuk is in modern day Turkey. It is in the Southern portion up in the hills. And it was after Jericho. You can see that here why it was in that particular place. It seems like there were some obsidian tools that were easy to obtain nearby and use for trade. Um, you could make them into weapons, mirrors. It's a kind of volcanic glass. It's very, very cool. Um, but what is interesting about Katul Hoyuk is it did not have a wall. And here you can see an actual ex excavation of it. And you, you can see an artist's imagination of what it looked like. They lived in a town without walls because the buildings were the wall. Uh, because all they didn't get into their houses using doors at street level. They got into them using ladders and into a hole on the roof, and the outside houses had no windows to the outside, no doors to the outside. Fascinating. Uh, but also, a thing to note here is we have really strong evidence of two important developments. One, there's this Earth Mother goddess. Uh, primarily, they worshipped this goddess. We see the vast majority of religious materials uh, relevant to this particular deity, and that religion was run by priestesses. Um, and it seems like this is directly connected to the kinds of things that they would have been doing, right? Like growing things in the ground, which was originally probably division of labor, a part of women's work. And so then this earth mother goddess representation of the earth and its natural fertility, it's a fascinating thing. Um, also, they developed a whole bunch of different crafts like pottery, weaving, uh, leatherworking, woodworking. The first of those two were huge developments because it fundamentally changed uh, the quality of life in people's lives. And we see direct evidence of that at this site as some of the earliest evidence of those things. Now, the last one we're going to talk about is Stonehenge. And this is located very far away from what we were talking about here, but it's interesting for other reasons. Um, it's much later, around 2000 BCE. Um, but it, the interesting thing about it is it's an indicator of the kinds of things that people spent time doing. This took more than 30,000 worker hours to build. And those stones are huge, and they did not have cranes to do this. So you have to wonder, like, what kind of labor were they using? Was it free labor? Were they forced to do this? Uh, we know generally that these stones and stones like this in other places around the world mark the position of sun and other celestial bodies at key points during the year. So it's kind of a calendar uh, purpose. But the largest stones, like these big things, which are, you know, person size, person size, person size. These big things were from like 15 miles away. Imagine that. And then some of them were from like 140 miles away, all the way over here in Wales. So archaeologists have done really cool work in matching the stones here to where they came from, which is really fascinating detective work. And one of the reasons that we talk about Stonehenge is because it's a mystery. Because to some degree, we don't really know what happened there. And it looks like people used it for different purposes over time. So it's a great example of the way that archaeology gives us hints and clues. But it's also limited in how much certainty we have for any given location. And so that is the end of prehistory. Join us next time for History History.